Hi, everyone here and around the world. Not only have we broken through a quarter million subscriptions at Earth Files, we're also receiving emails and messages and handwritten letters from many countries around the world. And I thank you all so much. After last week's October 25th, 2023 Earth Files YouTube broadcast with video producer Paul Sinclair about his new documentary, Wolflands, I have received many comments, messages, and emails about your own encounters with dogmen, wolfmen, werewolves. The strangest report of all comes from a professional truck driver in Michigan who had his 64th birthday this past Sunday, October 29th. His name is Joe Barger, and his dramatic encounter with a massive black-haired wolfman dogman was six years ago in early June of 2017. While Joe was driving his large semi-truck on Route 10 toward Baldwin, Michigan, about 75 miles northwest of Grand Rapids, not far from Lake Michigan, and in the center of the Manistee National Forest. In a recent interview, Joe Barger told me, quote, the werewolf dog man was 10 and a half feet tall and no less than a thousand pounds. It had enormous hands, not paws, as big as the semi-truck steering wheel. And while it ran next to my large semi-truck, it kept putting its hand in and out of the passenger window, close quote. Here now, from Kentwood, Michigan, a suburb of Grand Rapids near Lake Michigan, is professional truck driver Joe Barger talking to me this week about his shocking encounter in 2017 with a dogman, also known as a wolfman or werewolf, followed later on by U.S. intelligence agents threatening Joe to not talk about his encounter with a U.S. intelligence quote, asset, close quote. When this incident happened, I was driving my semi. It was 2017, the first week of June. I know the exact spot where Baldwin, Michigan is. It's probably 10 miles northwest as the crow flies from Baldwin, Michigan. And I was on Highway 10 in the Manistee National Forest. I am picking up a load at a paper mill that's up near Traverse City, which is way up north in the Lower Peninsula. I've been there several times, and I picked up about 43,000 pounds of huge paper rolls. They're just real big size of, like, small cars. I was pulling those. I had a lot of weight on it. and I was noticing that I was starting to lose air in my system, in my truck. And that's not a good thing if you know how air brakes work. If you start losing too much air, your brakes will lock up and you'll come to a complete stop on your trailer, especially. And that's where I was losing it, my trailer. And I didn't want to be carrying that heavy of a load and having low air pressure. So I pulled over to, it's kind of like a snowplow turnaround. It was wide enough to pull off and it was solid enough to hold the weight and everything off the side of the road, kind of in the gravel, 53-foot trailer. So I'm kind of way back there where that air leak was. And I grabbed my tools, and I was under there working on it and repairing it. And I was getting the weirdest feeling, and I was looking around in the woods. I'm close to the woods. I'm probably 15 feet from the wood line, 20 feet at the most. It was 7.30 to 8 o'clock in the evening. It's still a daylight. It don't get dark till like almost 10 o'clock, you know. Lots of daylight. And I see these shadows in the wood line back in a little ways. Dark, like a blackness. And they're moving around because I heard some things. The atmosphere felt weird. It was real odd. It was almost like an echo chamber. It was just the strangest feeling unnatural sounds. It's weird. and I'm really feeling real uneasy. And I got it fixed. It was a quick repair, not even five minutes. And I start to go and I'm at the 
bottom of a hill. I'm heavy, and I got a lot on the truck, so it's going to take a while to get up that hill because I'm only going to be going 20 to 25 until I get to the top of it. And it's pretty long grade, and it's kind of steep. Well, as I'm sitting there looking in my left mirror to make sure there's no traffic, so hold out onto the road, get going, everything's fine, no cars around. I start getting up the hill, maybe I get 100 yards, and I look over to my right side. I just felt a darkness in my window out of the corner of my eye, and there is a wolf head in my window. My windows are down because it's warm, and I wanted to get the breeze in. I'm at about 20 to 25 miles an hour, maybe, and a wolf head is just keeping up with me like it's a Sunday stroll. This wolf-looking thing is staring at me, and he's looking down. He's stooping down. I'm sitting at nine feet. He's stooping down, so he had to be 10 to 11 feet tall. Had to be. He's running next to me on two feet, looking down through the window at me, stooping down. And he's got his hands in front of him, and he's got hands, and they're huge. And his head is like taking up a semi-window, you know, big. And he's just right there next to my mirror. And he is black. He sells black. His eyes are like a deep amber gold color. He looks like a werewolf, but he doesn't look like an animal either. He's got intelligence. He's looking straight at me. His eyes starting around, looking at everything in my cab, like really fast. And he's reaching in. He reaches in and pulls his hand away. As he did that a few times, his claws are about three inches long, looking like raccoon hands, but giant. And do you mean that this tall, wolf-like being that's running right alongside of you in the cab, as if it's no problem, on two yep. feet, and that he is reaching in with one of his arms at you, touching you? Not touching me. He's on my passenger side. I'm in the driver's side. There is no shoulder there, so he's running in the dirt. There's actually dirt and weeds and grass where he's running. And I didn't even really hear if there was any sound he was making with his feet hitting the ground. I wasn't really hearing it. He was really smooth and smooth, like silky smooth in his movements, almost like a cat. So you're seeing him through the passenger window. And he's looking in at me. He's like running alongside of my truck right outside of the passenger door. And he stooped down. He's got shoulders and he's running, but his arms aren't moving like a man would, even though he's got similar torso and hands. It's kind of like he's out there like a raptor running he had to stoop down to look in and i'm sitting at about nine feet yeah he was huge he was massive he was about a thousand pounds i would say and he was extending his left arm into the truck yeah a little bit the hand was so big that it was as big as your steering wheel or bigger about the size of my steering wheel yes and his hand he kind of cupped it, and it came in, and then he pulled it back out. His nails did scrape on the top of my door, and he was also trying to pull on my outside handle to open the door because there were scratches on that, wow. on the door, too. While you're seeing his face, when you do see and you connect with his eyes, did you ever have any impressions, images, anything telepathic come from this being? Well, the thing was, is this all happened really fast. And he looked to me like he was trying to send a message. Like, I'm going to get you when there's nothing you can do about it. I don't know if it was telepathic, but that's the vibe I was getting. Because his eyes were not animalistic, like you would see in a normal wolf or dog or any animal. You know how they don't have an intelligence that a human would have behind their eyes like this did. This had intelligence or as close to it as we are. Mm -hmm. The way it just was looking at me and conveying its intention. Right. And then I automatically thought, I have a 45 Colt revolver strapped to my seat. 
that's for my protection against people, you know? Right. So I did this without really even a second thought. It was a snap decision, an automatic impulse. I pulled my gun and I pulled it fast. And at that exact second, he saw the barrel of that gun and I shot twice and he went down. He went down and he went down like he got hit by a clothesline. Lights out. Hmm. I hit him in the eye, and I had copper bullets that were special, extremely nasty bullets. They open up like a broadhead, like an arrow. They open up that wide. And did you slam the brake on to see, or what happened? No, I was still trying to get up this hill, and I didn't know if I was in another dimension. I was really freaking out. My ears are ringing. It was chaotic, but this truck was still going up the hill. And then I kind of got my composure a little bit. Okay, I'm not crazy. I don't hallucinate. Yeah, there's two bullets out of my gun. Make sure I'm not crazy. There is a place up the road, a little picnic area. I can get this big truck turned around and go back about a mile and a half from there. If that thing's still alive, I'm going to run it over with this truck. That's what was going on through my mind. Can't let that thing live. It's a killing machine, whatever that is. It's a werewolf. I get back down there. It should still be there. When I hit it, I saw it in my mirror, and I saw it was sliding in the weeds, knocking down the weeds, and as it was sliding through the weeds, going off and kicking up dirt and everything, I could see it had a tail, a long, bushy tail. It had the legs like a normal wolf would, and they were huge. It looked like the size of a quarter horse. Wow. It was just so massive. You're describing an all-black wolf that is on two legs with intelligence reaching into your cab, and you even have the impression that it is thinking it's going to come in and take you down. That's exactly right, yeah. So as I came back around, if he's not dead, I'm going to run him over. I get back down the hill, and he wasn't there, but what was there was the jeep. A J-E-E-P Jeep? Yeah, the black Jeep was there. From where? I don't know. There was two people there, a man and a woman. I was worried. I just killed a giant werewolf. (laughs) I didn't want to say that, you know. Didn't you say, I just shot a huge wolf here? How are you here in a Jeep and the wolf is gone? What is this, uh, (laughs) Twilight Zone? I I don't know what's happening. (laughs) I don't know where this thing run off to. Do you think they were military or CIA or something like that? Come to find out later, that this was maybe a year after my encounter. I get pulled into a scale house in Indiana, and the state police are holding me there for federal authorities for some reason. I thought, man, I'm in trouble. I thought it was just something to do with trucking. These guys showed up and started intimidating me. This is how things are going to work. We know you're talking about these dogmen. You're not going to do that anymore. This is how it's going to go down. And if you don't believe us, we can do things to show you. And they say, you know what it's about. You killed our asset. This man who was acting like military government said to you, you just killed one of our assets? Yeah, he said you killed our asset. Did you say, why is this an asset to you? Well, I tried to ask that, but they kept shutting me down about it. And I said, well, what do you need it for? And they were just irate about it. They said, you just don't know how much trouble you caused us. They did not mention it's a homeland security matter. That's all we're saying. That's all you get. How could a nine-foot-tall black wolf man be a homeland security asset? They took my gun, too. They said, you can make you fail a drug test. We can do all kinds of stuff. We can really wreck your life. And they did do some stuff. They shut my bank account down for a minute just to show they could do something. And this was 2017? Yeah. And in 2017, like today, why is the government of the United States playing hardball on what is apparently a real truth? We're not alone in this universe. There are other intelligences, and some of them are based inside of our planet and have been for probably millions of years. Yeah, yeah. And how can it be an asset, this creature? Well, you know, we're 
speculating on it, but we've heard of stories at the border where they use these things to take care of people coming over the border. I don't know if they're true. There's no way a human could run 25 miles an hour with dog legs. Up a hill. No way. I could see the muscle tone. I could see the tongue was like as big as a cow's tongue. The saliva was dripping. It had long canine teeth, like top and bottom. A lot of jagged teeth there. You could see the flesh in the mouth. You could see the glistening in the eyes. Nothing about it looked like it was not a real creature. And if it is part of the extraterrestrial presence on planet Earth and has been here for a long time based underground and coming up to do a variety of confusing and mysterious things that people have seen through the centuries, why in 2023 going forward can't the entire human population be told the truth? that our governments and military seem to know. Why can't we, as a civilization, be told the truth? I think they want to control everything. Yesterday, Joe and his partner, Jenny, sent me a follow-up to share in tonight's Earth Files, quote, I, Joe, reached out to an old army friend who I had stayed in touch with over the years and was now with an intelligence agency. And he confirmed for me that they have a quote, dog man project. But it was not the one he, my army friend ran. I still don't know what type of project he runs, but he said that he would look into it. And after that, things cooled down. And as far as I know, I was left alone. And then, pass forward four years to August of 2022, after I attended the PRT Dogman Conference in Paris, Tennessee. I was interviewed by a few researchers for YouTube channels about my encounter. And then two weeks later, the Ruger gun the agents took from me at the truck way station was put back in the bed of my pickup without my knowledge. Again, no paperwork. I took that as a clear message to shut up. Nothing else has happened though to date, but that Labor Day of 2022, Jenny and I went to Kentucky to get together with several people in this community of dog man, wolf man, werewolf researchers. One man, Martin Groves, a sheriff who retired after 30 years has had his own incredible experience and also harassment from these guys. And he was even run off the road while trailering a camper. Sheriff Groves and his wife, Sheila, sustained minor injuries. And shortly after that, the feds came to his house, intimidating him to shut up and mention things that we had only talked about in the living room of Martin Groves. Since that time, nothing else has happened. But with the release of Josh Turner's book featuring my encounter and likely this Earth Files interview, the story may not be over. And I guess we will see. One thing that I thought about in doing this work with Joe Barger is that I think that our American government has been developing assets among non-human intelligences interacting with Earth since at least Project Sigma that was a part of Project Gleam and Project Aquarius going all the way back to Project Sigma was originally established as part of Project Gleam in 1954. It became a separate project in 1976, and its mission was then, and I think still ongoing, no matter what its name is today, is to establish communications with aliens, non-humans. And this project, in a document that I have, a Project Aquarius document, met with positive success when in 1959, the United States established what they called primitive communications with 
aliens without specifying which ones. Let's assume that in the beginning it may have been greys, Nordics, maybe even tall whites. On April 25, 1964, a U.S. Air Force intelligence officer met two aliens at a prearranged location in the desert of New Mexico. The contact lasted for approximately three hours. And based on the aliens' language given to us by an extraterrestrial biological entity, the United States Air Force officer managed to exchange basic information with the two aliens. This project is continuing at an Air Force base in New Mexico operated by MJ-12 and the National Security Agency, also known as the NSA." Close quote. I think Project Sigma is where communication efforts began historically long ago that could also have evolved to include trying to interface with many different alien-related life forms, such as even Sasquatch and Wolfmen. And that is perhaps how a huge creature like the one Joe saw and shot could have been or are to this day interacting with humans as, quote, assets, close quote, in top secret programs. I welcome hearing from those of you who have been in medicine, military, and intelligence, who have firsthand knowledge that might add insights about the use of the word asset to a wolfman, dogman. And Ian, I wonder if we've had any comments tonight from viewers who might have more information. Yes, we do. In fact, uh, we've got Kingsway 13 in the chat tonight. Kingsway 13 says, my buddy has a very similar story from California, eerily similar to this guy's. Like this gentleman is saying, it was about 10 feet in height and very fast and strong. My buddy has a mechanic shop in a hangar near Marita, California. The feds came there also and told him not to speak on it. Uh, I was sure would like, if he could, email me right now, earthfiles at earthfiles.com with contact information. I never give out any contact information, but it would speed things up if you would email me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com how to contact you. I really appreciate this. Ian, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I've followed this for some years now, uh, this topic. Uh, Monica Marinda is in the chat tonight, says, I've been following these cryptid beings for a long time. Podcast, too many people have reported seeing them. I think I must calculate that I've listened to, must be close on seven or 800 eyewitness accounts that people have, have spoken about, including many attacks on vehicles. And it makes me wonder as well if this asset, uh, which was closely followed by perhaps handlers or um, members of uh, some government black budget organization, uh, whether Joe was actually a target for it or whether this creature had gone rogue. Well, that is, a, that is an interesting question. Um, there is something, though, about this background that I've mentioned about Sigma and Gleam and the fact that uh, if you think back about coming out of World War II, beginning to learn that there are the Greys and the Nordics and others that are here, and that in at least the last 2,000 years of Earth literature, as I have talked about in previous uh, program about the whole issue of uh, dog type, wolf type beings, um, that if it goes back and has been reported by Herodotus in Greece and even earlier, then this is a phenomena of a life form that has been on this earth for a very long time. And how does it happen? It's because they're based underground. And once you start exploring how everything could be underground that is quote unquote extraterrestrial, well, we're the surface life and we are the ones that get manipulated on the surface and also we're, where there is interaction, harvests of collection of sperm and eggs and tissues in animal mutilations and human abductions. And 
the, the box gets bigger and the lens gets clearer the more we go into the real details that have been behind projects such as Sigma under Gleam. The goal was to contact and collaborate or find out more about non-humans. So the idea that so many decades later that there might even be a program to use the very specific intelligence of one of the wolfmen, dogmen that have been part of Earth's history underground for so long. It, it, I can see how it might have come about and it would be very uh, helpful to hear from anybody who has first-hand information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Linda, we, we've also got uh, Brian Morgan has been in the chat this evening. Uh, Brian Morgan tells us a fascinating tale that his mother and I uh, both saw a wolfman-like creature the night my grandpa passed away in his home. We stayed the night there because we'd been there all day with him. Now, he goes on to give us more details. Uh, it says, that evening around midnight, I started hearing a growling-like sound. But it seemed to be coming from down the road. Uh, it was growling so loud, it shook the wall. I jumped when I saw, and, uh, saw it and touched the wall next to me and felt it vibrating. It leaned closer. It was inches from my face and let out this ungodly roar. <clears throat> it says, um, around 2 a.m., it was getting louder and sounded like it was outside the window. I looked and there was nothing there. 3 a.m., I woke up. It was next to my bed, leaning over me. And he says, we have pictures showing massive prints in the snow that started in the middle of the backyard and went up to both my window and my mum's window, then onto the roof. And That's it's late. a combination, Ian, of the physical, that there are tracks outside. And yet what happens in human lives with these beings can be in some kind of, was it a dream? Was there really something in there? Was there a projection from a physical being on the outside, mentally into the human on the inside, that then sees images, but it's still not literal matter body of some kind of uh, wolf, man, dog in the actual bedroom? And underscoring that is uh, when uh, I was getting Joe uh, Barger's uh, work done that Casey, who does transcripts for me, uh, wrote a fascinating email and it was about how at one point when he was younger that he thought that he woke up and saw a hole open up in the roof in his bedroom and saw what he thought was like the descriptions of a wolf man come down and he didn't understand how, but this, he's watching this. He thinks he's totally awake. And then he wakes up for real and the sun is shining. And everything about what happened during the night was so literal to him that he runs back to the bedroom and he's looking at the ceiling and trying to understand. He knew that something opened up. And that's where this twilight zone often is between human experiences and what we see and the other intelligences that are interacting with us on different frequencies, different parts of the brain. And it is fascinating because this is a part of the whole huge millennia long story of other intelligences interacting on Earth. That's right. These creatures, uh, they are obviously physical in the physical, uh, to, you know, in, in our physical reality, but they also seem to possess a capability, or at least some of them, a capability of invisibility, cloaking, or going interdimensional. And uh, right. this appearing next to bedsides as well. We were contacted last week by the Baltic Project, who tells us that uh, in one of the Baltic states, I can't remember which one it was now, uh, as a child, they would have an experience of the wolf creature being in their bedroom uh, at night. And I've heard similar stories from the UK as well, which parallel this, uh, this form of uh, appearance of a wolf-like creature actually within the bedroom itself of the, of the sleeping child. Right, and Ian, it is exactly like Joe Barger in the truck who is getting this strong signal from this 
it, it's clearly uh, in the matter world in terms of something uh, that is uh, perspiring and slurpy dripping uh, running right alongside the door. But Joe is getting a distinct feeling that this being is after him. It, it wants to take him down. And that's where you get into, is it telepathy in a classic way, or just uh, humans say they have intuition? Well, intuition could very well be the telepathy coming from that wolf man, and that some part of Joe's brain was picking it up. That's right. Joe mentions that he felt uneasy, and, uh, and he picked up on this with must have been a very strong intuition and one could only wonder what would happen if joe wasn't armed and had that uh, <laughs> weapon next to him if he hadn't been able to use that what the creature's intent was and how it might have ended completely differently well and wouldn't it be wonderful if we were understanding that we were actually could be in a universe where there was no necessity for killing anything that all life forms had relationships mentally, spiritually, even physically in terms of agape uh, partnership, and that nobody had to kill anything. That's the part that always bothers me. Um, it, we are in a kind of treacherous time where we think about guns and all of that, and yet what would happen maybe if the if there hadn't been the tension around i've got to shoot this now it's just the feeling if the government is learning how to collaborate <laughs> maybe eventually um wolfmen dogmen whatever they are might be able to be introduced in a in a non-threatening way yeah and and I want to say that uh, we're, we're happy and proud to have Joe in the audience tonight. And uh, he's actually uh, in the chat this evening and he's answering questions from our audience. So we're Joe. happy to have Joe here. Yeah, Thank Joe, you, Joe, great. I'm so glad. I think it's one of the uh, most fascinating stories involving this whole question of the wolf, the dog, uh, the weir in something that is human, it's human in shape and looks like a wolf or a dog. This is one of the most fascinating encounters and experiences that I personally have ever heard. And what is the government's yeah, I mean, relationship to it? That's right. Uh, now, they used the word asset, which, uh, which was, well, Moonlight 75 says it's very chilling that they called this life form, whatever it was, an asset. So that's that's very, you know, U.S. government, pro black project kind of speak for something that they obviously had knowledge about. They were aware of its existence. And obviously they made sure that, uh, that things were covered up and it acted in such a strange way. So there is something going on and it shows that this black project that it also we're familiar with in the UFO community, also extends into the cryptid community. Now, have we gotten any uh, comments from anyone who is implying that they have their own knowledge about a military intel operation that is collaborating with, perhaps these are advanced beings, uh, because they look like a standing up wolf doesn't mean that they might not be extremely brilliant. I mean, this is is there, are there really programs in which these kinds of beings are considered assets and are working in collaboration with the current inside Intel MJ-12? Well, I'm happy to say that the, uh, the experience of the friend of the uh, person I gave the details of earlier, Kingsway 13, he says he will be contacting us and giving us further information about what happened with his friend, with his friend's experience, and how the feds, uh, he calls them the feds, interfered and told him not to talk about it. Well, let me share a story briefly that relates very much to this and would definitely be another 
case that implies there is collaboration uh, between perhaps humans or perhaps the eyewitness was seeing a blonde, blue-eyed human in collaboration with a Sasquatch and interpreted it as human, and it might have been E.T. So putting that as, that's another possibility of the relationship. It was a ranch, a large ranch, uh, between Colorado Springs and uh, the area that would be south of Littleton in Denver. And they ended up contacting uh, a, a man who was working for a lab in Denver. Uh, uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle at the University of Wyoming got involved in this case. And everyone in the family on this ranch saw these beings. There was a husband and wife, and there was a relative, and they were running cattle. There had been mutilations in the general area. And the father, there was also a, a younger, a child, and the father of that child was becoming impatient about that they were seeing lights. They knew that there had been mutilations. Uh, they don't understand why their ranch is targeted. They had had a, a friend who had been staying over one night and their living room had a big picture window. And the guest uh, was looking out the big picture window and saw what looked like an eight to 10 foot tall uh, Harry in the category of the Sasquatch Bigfoot just step across the front yard as he watched through the window, almost as if it were performance. Okay, all of this was taking place. And the father with the younger child decides that he's going to take a gun and get in a car and he's going to go where they suspect that there's some landing of some kind of craft. And this was directly to me from Dr. Sprinkle, who studied this. He said, the father has the gun, has the son, comes down to a part of the forest on the back lot of their big ranch where they think that lights have gone in and out. That's why they went there. And then suddenly stops in his tracks because he sees a silver disc it has a rectangle open on the side, like where it would be a door, but there was no visible door. The father and the son are there, and they seem to be communicating with what they, they first were seeing, meaning the father and the son are not where the disc is. They're, they're approaching, and they're staying hidden. But they see what they thought at first was a human. And then they realize that the, there is uh, something about what's going on between this blonde being and a large Sasquatch. And the Sasquatch is holding a black box. They estimated it was about 12 inches by 12 inches. And the the being, or the, the hairy being, is like this with this black box and their red lights that the father and son can see from the distance where they are uh, somewhere back. And then they see the blonde being do something to the box. They didn't understand what was happening at all. And when they, something occurs, the lights change the blinking and the Sasquatch dropped to the ground, absolutely dropped. And that scared them. And they retreated back to their ranch house. They still, to this day, did not know what happened. Well, it is possible that such a control, refined control, over the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, the Wolfman, through the ages, it might be that it is technology because Sasquatch and Bigfoot might be artificial intelligence advanced that is on this planet, has been for a very long time, 
that helps do work for the blonde beings, the tall whites, perhaps the grays. And that is reinforced by the 1976 case in Montana, Great Falls. It was written up by Keith Wolverton, the deputy in the Great Falls Sheriff's Office at that time. He got a report from a rancher who had gone uh, deer hunting, had a 30 6 rifle, comes around a bend out in very, uh, like nobody lived out their land. But in front of him is what he estimated was eight foot tall, hairy, glowing eyes. And the rancher brought up his gun and just shot, sort of like what Joe, when he was talking about his instinct, just suddenly shoot. So the rancher shoots at the eight foot tall reddish brown Sasquatch and it disappeared in a flash of light. There have been many cases about the Sasquatch disappearing in flashes of light. What is the relationship of the Sasquatch phenomena to the wolfman, dogman, werewolf phenomena, which has been reported for uh, over a thousand years? What are their roles in relationship to the humanoid non-humans of the grays, of the reptilians, of the blondes, of the talls? It's fascinating. It really is. But it, these are, to me, evidence. What happened in Colorado Springs Ranch, what happened in Great Falls, the collapse of the Sasquatch in whatever this box was, and uh, disappearing in a flash of light in Montana. What are they really? Is it technology made to look like a creature or is it a creature that has some artificial intelligence relationship with matter worlds in which it disappears in, in flashes of light? That's, this is how complex <laughs> all of this is. It absolutely is so complex, Linda. Many people talk about the intelligence that they feel from the encounters they have with dogma. And I'm very proud to be able to say as well, uh, to, to, tonight we have Josh Turner himself from oh. Paranormal Roundtable, his own YouTube channel. He's in the, super, in the chat tonight. Thanks for the super chat, Josh. It's great to have you along. And, and Ian, he, yes. let every, I showed the cover of his book, uh, it, as I understand, it has come out in 2023, and it. That's right. Uh, so in this show tonight, uh, there is the cover of the book, and uh, if uh, Josh, if he wants to give you some information that you can put up in the chat, how to get the book. But I imagine it's on Amazon, if I'm remembering. It absolutely is. Uh, I'm putting this up now. It's uh, the, well, the book that we're talking about is. The one, uh, Werewolves and the Dogman Phenomenon by Josh Turner, uh, published August 2023. It's uh, definitely a good read. I'd recommend everyone to get it. It's got lots of good reviews on Amazon. He's also the author of The Bigfoot Phenomenon, and that as well uh, is available from Amazon. And Josh Turner's YouTube channel, Josh, if you're there still, post the links to your channel. Yeah, good. Paranormal Roundtable. It's a great discussion. His show uh, it goes out. Uh, well, Joe, uh, Josh, just tell us the um, the times and uh, the information for your channel, and let's post yeah. it here in the chat for everybody. Yeah, it's fascinating. The whole big, big uh, sort of headline: um, the collaboration between intel agencies of the United States and their efforts to develop assets in Bigfoot. Wolfmen, I mean, it, it is, um, it's an amazing, amazing, I guess you would say, another branch of the long evolving other intelligence on this earth and all the mysteries and questions that go with it. That's right. We've got uh, Hans, Hansi Hans Driscoll says, there's ancient paintings of dog men in India. A Hindu deity is Hanuman. He's a monkey man. There's paintings of Hanuman working with dog men thousands of years ago. That, again, adds to the historical context of this, uh, this creature. And we've also got um, the secret uh, spaceship in the 
give us, gives us a super chat this evening. Thank you very much for that. Says the story of Beowulf, an old English poem, speaks of Grendel, a forest monster, who is possibly a Bigfoot, in my opinion. The story is from around 1000 AD. What do you think about this? Thank you, Linda. Well, thank you. And I'm wondering if we have more questions in the audience tonight that I can try to deal with. Yeah, we'll go to the questions in a minute. If anyone's got questions, please post them in the, in the uh, chat this evening and I'll relay them to Linda. Okay. I need to do the super chats this evening. Oh. We've got Terry D, Yin Yang Glow, Captain Kurt, who says it's a great topic tonight, Linda. Um, we've got the secret spaceship, Whisper of Love, and Miss Anonymous. Uh, it's Miss Anonymous's birthday tomorrow, so I'm giving Miss Anonymous a shout out for her right. birthday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, by the way, uh, Moonbird has let me know he's not in the chat tonight. He's actually in Savannah, Georgia, I believe, watching Stevie Nicks in concert. So well, good. For that Moonbird. And, and Moonbird has been with the Earth Files YouTube channel in the audience right from the very beginning. And so we have this arc of having heard from Moonbird, and it continues to this day. And it's just wonderful to realize that he has sustained uh, his presence uh, in this Earth Files YouTube channel for, what is it now, four years? Oh, well, yeah, it's at least four years. Linda, we've got a qu question here from Space Ghost. Uh, he says, question, is there evidence of the dog planet, the dog star, having advanced canines? That's, uh, I suppose, a link to what they call the do dog star, the Dogon tribe, etc. Can you comment on that? What the Dogon tribe described in Mali that ended up in Robert Temple's brilliant book, uh, The Serious Mystery, were marine creatures. They are the ones that they drew uh, with the, the fish head coming up here and the scales. It would be completely different. But it's the same bigger concept of an interaction between humans and something that is definitely not human, is extraterrestrial, basically communicates it's extraterrestrial from another star system that was Sirius, the dog star. And so, even though the dog star has the word dog, what the Mali tribe was communicating about in the serious mystery were beings that came out of the ocean that had scales, but they were not from Earth, was the bottom line. And that the tribe learned all of this information about the fact that Sirius had this small, dense, binary star that nobody in the Earth, no one in astronomy knew anything much about the, the binary uh, relationship until after there had been this uh, investigation and the serious mystery had been written. So that left this huge question pulsing in the air. How would a tribe in Mali, Africa, have information for decades going back, uh, be even before the 20th century, about this tiny that you couldn't see with the eye, um, another planet that was next to the, the Sirius star. So that has always been fascinating. And Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, has played a very important role in history uh, in Egypt and other places. So I think it's part of the hypothesis that advanced intelligences have been coming and going on this planet for at least 278 million years. They've all had different projects that the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst who told me in December of 1999 that Earth was considered to be a great laboratory in which to mix and match genes and develop different lines of life. And the, so there could be this very long uh, history of extraterrestrials that we, as a created species, by 
uh, extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. We are one of the laboratory products. So the, that, the fact that there might be five or ten major extraterrestrial civilizations that have used the Earth system for, the, for their own experimentation, for the development of life forms, is to me... Uh, that is a, hypo a hypothesis that I think eventually it will, we will learn s something of that nature about our creation, so much else life creation, and what exactly are the interests of other beings that have high civilizations in other solar systems in part of the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. There are over three trillion galaxies in this universe. So the odds are that a bunch of advanced intelligences have been here before. Yeah, Linda, I, I don't know if you can hear this, but I'm, I'm in a lot of heavy rainfall here. It, I hope it's not draining out too much of the sound. But the UK is experiencing another storm, storm Caspian uh, Kieran at the moment, I think it is. And we're experiencing some high high winds and uh, extreme weather. Well, anyway, Ian, we'll, the irony yeah. is you've never been clearer. <laughs> <laughs> you may be having a storm yeah. and it's working here very well. <laughs> yes, Linda, let's just remind everybody that this show uh, goes out as a podcast as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so wherever you get your podcast, we'll also post a link in the uh, chat and in the description below the video. So this show, as all the shows do, goes out as a podcast also. And let's talk as well about your upcoming conference appearances in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles and uh, Arizona. Sedona, yeah. Sedona, Arizona yeah. in March and Conscious Life Expo in February. And I hope that a lot of our uh, Earth Files viewers in those states and some who can travel will come because maybe there is a sense uh, if we're on a planet as rocky uh, politically as it feels like it is right now, that maybe there will be some outside help uh, and maybe we're going to have some more, I'm going to say, significant headlines about other life in this uh, universe. I hope in this coming year. I hope it finally happens. That's right. Okay, so we've got uh, Eddie Cordovan Hypnowolf says, Hi, Earthfars. I had an alien abduction experience in 2018, and I recently met with Barbara Lamb for a regression. I'd love to speak to Linda about it. I've uh, asked Eddie to um, contact us at earthfiles at earthfiles.com and we want to make sure that everybody's got that email address properly. Earthfiles at earthfiles.com to contact us with your own experiences. And Eddie says, thank you, Earthfiles, I will do. I'll see about getting an artist friend to draw up some pictures as well. Yeah. And uh, can he email me or you about which type he has interacted with? That's right. It's always the question that we ask, which type do you experience or, you know, if it's possible, give us a, 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 an illustration or a drawing, your own drawing. Um, what Doc's family says, how is werewolf part of Homeland Security? Going back to Joe's yeah. experience. <laughs> yes, I mean, it is the question of the evening, of the week, the month, the year. Uh, how is it that Wolfmen could be assets for the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, whoever would be in charge, the implication being one of those, and uh, developing some sort of uh, a relationship that would be strong enough that they would refer to this creature that Joe Barger shot in the eyes as an asset and that they were really, really pissed off that he had shot it. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Conan, Konana Stinko says, Linda, do you know of Gilgamesh, DNA of the Giants? 
the whole huge complex Gilgamesh story is it's it's like everything we're talking about and more is in pieces of it and it to me it is a challenge it is so dense what really was the reality around Gilgamesh at the time in other words are we seeing history that would be coming through the lens of angels and religion that might be today's extraterrestrials from other solar systems in this galaxy and other galaxies? You see what I mean? And that somewhere in the middle, there probably is a truth that is both hard-based fact as well as interpretive dreams and all of the things from centuries ago. So it's hard to be, say, okay, this is a story about, that was more interpretive. And now we're at what feels to me like finally for the first time, the moment when the Homo sapien experiment, a genetic experiment, may finally be on the threshold of being actually introduced to the other intelligences that may have be the ones who genetically put us in to experimentation. Gilgamesh gives a context for all kinds of interactions going on with all kinds of strange things long ago. Where did they meet? That's sort of what we're asking here. Are you there? Did the rain swamp you? <laughs> Now I'm still here. We've got What the Fox family is in the audience tonight, and they're talking about an experience where they actually found some footprints. And uh, I'm just going to go and just looking for that. Here we are. Uh, we took some pictures of a bipedal animal, looked like a wolf, raccoon print. It was double the size of my husband's foot on the trail path. It was at least 5.7 foot in between prints. Uh, and where was Where's this physically, to... Ian? Where? I'm not sure. Give us some more details, what the Fox family, I know you're still in there, and I can see you're still in our chat. Give us some more details of what you actually saw and what you've got. And we'd also like to see those pictures uh, of those prints. Please well, the, send them to uh, well, Earth Files. Yeah, well, Ian, there's another thing we could maybe start helping, is that getting plaster of Paris in tracks, if there really are large unusual tracks, or even small unusual, is to get plaster of Paris. Uh, local high schools and colleges usually can help people with this. And then you have a mold, and the mold at least is evidentiary. Um, and in between getting a mold done and finding large unusual tracks, is trying to call somebody in a zoology department in a local college or calling some a high school and saying, can you come and help us scientifically investigate these tracks? And I've worked with people who have done that. And that's where we all need to be trying to bring to bear in everything that's happening, always evidentiary and chain of custody. Where was the first moment that somebody saw a track or found a, a mutilated animal or and then you you keep a log of chain of custody as things are uh, occurred maybe somebody comes in from a medical office a veterinarian office or a high school or college if we were all trying to bring to bear more scientific method into analyzing tracks uh, something that might happen on the back of a car, uh, scratches that might come down that have happened and been reported, uh, being able to maybe film or videotape in infrared something that if it were in normal light, you're not going to be, be able to see the details. If everybody, oh, and tripods. Everybody needs tripods for their cell phone and their cameras so we don't have the flutters. That it would really be something if we all started trying 
to think like scientists in how to best investigate all kinds of evidence. That would, I, I mean, I know people have been trying that for a long time, but we, we really need to put energy into physical matter evidence. Yeah, I, I've got a guy who lives local to me. I've met him and he was actually mountaineering and he actually took uh, photographs of Yeti prints. I've seen those Yeti prints firsthand. Angela Ellison says she saw some prints of the LBA, LBL, that's the land between the lakes in between Kentucky and Tennessee, well known for the Dogman phenomena and other Sasquatch uh, and other cryptid phenomena. She says the dog prints were the size of a beer can and says she's sending those prints, those photographs to you as well. And I hope uh, tonight as we are coming to the end of this particular program, that all of you will take into your mind and your heart that you have to start on all of this, looking at Earth as a huge, gigantic hotel. We're the surface life at many different layers in many deep caverns going down over a thousand miles are huge spaces that as I understand that varieties of intelligence like the tall whites, the Nordics, reptilians, a variety of greys, they have been actual occupiers deep beneath the basins of the oceans, inside of mountains, down deep below in our planet. And I don't find that to be scary at all. I find it to be fascinating because we are a surface life that is genetically was set in motion. The DNA was manipulated by outside intelligences who have been experimenting here for so long. I don't find that upsetting. I don't find that terrifying. We all should be trying to be dealing with truth and that governments should stop classifying reality and we should move on with a revolution to what the truth is. And that the, the clearer that you see how our planet can be used in so many different layers and has been for so long, it then explains why on the surface we're not bumping into all of these beings at all. They, and in our system, inside of uh, Jupiter's large Ganymede moon, it's my understanding that whole moon is a base of the tall whites. And none of this, to me, is frightening. It's fascinating. And that we, we, we need to know and deserve to know the facts about other life in this universe. The hard part, and now I'm giving sympathy to the government and the military and intel. I think that there really are hostiles. I think the insects on Epsilon Eridani, referred to as tronoloids to President Ronald Reagan in the briefing given to him about various other life forms in March 6 to 8, 1981, that the insects were then, are now a problem. But if it is true that the tall whites are able to fend off pretty much any hostile that might be looking at us, and that they are spiritual, that they care about life, uh, they care about their lives, why can't we be introduced to them and start moving forward, learning all of the truth with the sense that we have some sort of help. But the reason I bring all this up is it's all part of the complexity. If everything were rosy and peaches out in Milky Way galaxy, we would have been told about this uh, long, 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 long ago. But on Earth, in our own planet, in our own species, of Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien. What is happening on Earth right now? Bombs, missiles, wars, fights, just among Homo sapiens sapien. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could turn collaboration that is now 
one, one way, meaning the tall whites may be helping because they have a vested interest in us humans. Maybe they were part of the experimenters. But that they know how to uh, go through point to point in the universe in Alcubierre warp drive. And they know how to handle this, the insects and that they know so much. Not for us to be weakened in a relationship with geniuses, but for us to know solidly that there are geniuses who know how to protect. And therefore, we can go through a whole new revolution of being introduced to other intelligences and other life in this universe and that the probability exists that there are even other universes and that the whole macro reality is so astonishing. And we are on planet Earth that orbits our beautiful yellow sun that in and of itself could be treacherous at times in terms of activity on the sun. We can't shriek away from knowing all of the truth. And that in knowing all of the truth as much as we can makes us stronger and hopefully able eventually to have the ability to know that we have strong collaboration with beings that can help, not hurt. And that we humans that are hurting ourselves on this planet right now so badly, that we need to evolve so that our context doesn't keep going into hatred for each other. We need to get to a new intersection where humans embrace Homo sapien, knowing that we are only one of millions of life forms, a number that I don't even know what to name. Maybe, maybe that profound simple knowledge would make it harder for humans to hate and kill each other on earth when I am convinced, I am convinced, Homo sapien is a very, very special life form. And the part that we keep seeming to miss is that our souls are valued beyond anything that humans seem to understand. Wouldn't it be great if the whole planet, everything on it, was replacing war and bullets and nukes and missiles with tremendous curiosity about other life in the universe, a lot of it high civilization, and that children would be encouraged into math and science to become astronauts, not just for the moon and not just for Mars, but for going beyond even this solar system. I want to do that. <laughs> I love you guys. Agape hug to everyone. And we'll see you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been